I haven't really established something on this channel that I probably should have made clear a long time ago. So here it goes. I love Godzilla. I absolutely love him. I love his design, I love his roars, I love his atomic laser breath, and more importantly, I love his movies. Godzilla has a huge record for having one of the largest movie libraries in any franchise ever. This includes the first film, about 14 sequels to the first film, a 1984 reboot sequel that only keeps continuity with the first film, 5 sequels to that reboot, another reboot sequel, a second reboot sequel, a third reboot sequel, a fourth reboot sequel, then a sequel to the fourth reboot sequel, and then a movie that just looks at all previous 27 movies and just goes, fuck it, let's do some crazy shit. Wow. So yeah, Godzilla has a huge history of film spanning over 50 years of cinema, along with two American-made movies and one new production in Japan in 2016, plus three Netflix anime movies. Jesus Christ. Am I missing one? Wait. Nah, I don't think I am. There's a lot to talk about here. I always wanted to do reviews on the Godzilla movies with the idea that I would end up making over 30 goddamn videos on this atomic monster I admire so much. While I've got a lot on my plate to look at, we gotta remember it all started with one movie, which is... Godzilla. Um, actually, the movie is called Gojira. Godzilla. Also, just a heads up, I'm reviewing the Japanese versions of all these movies while briefly mentioning the American-made counterparts if it feels necessary to. Anyways, enjoy the review. The first Godzilla actually came to fruition from a rather dark side of Tokyo's history. It was 1954, nearly one decade after World War II ended. Japan was in a pretty poor state after the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which killed hundreds of thousands of their civilians. Needless to say, the US and Japan weren't on good terms after the war. However, even after all the fighting had stopped, America continued to test nuclear weapons on a few Marshall Islands called Bikini Atoll. This resulted in an incident that would end up becoming the main inspiration for Godzilla. A fishing boat, which was, well, now ironically called Lucky Dragon Number 5, was sailing along the sea. The boat was just a few miles away from Bikini Atoll when the US decided to test the biggest nuclear weapon they ever detonated. Castle Bravo. The crew of the Lucky Dragon No. 5 witnessed the whole thing from a distance, but weren't harmed by the bomb itself going off. However, they ended up getting covered in all sorts of debris which resulted from the explosion. Said debris, which showered just about every crew member of the fishing boat, including their fish, was fallout, which sadly affected the crew of the Lucky Dragon No. 5 as radiation poisoning would slowly kill most of the crew over the coming years. The Lucky Dragon incident made national headlines, and brought in some very important questions over whether or not nuclear testing should continue in the way it was. Okay, you're probably wondering, Cooper, what's with the history lesson? What does any of this have to do with the first Godzilla movie? Well, the Lucky Dragon incident is the main thing that led to the creation of Godzilla being made. Producer Tamiyoko Tanaka and director Ashiro Honda, along with special effects operator E.G. Tsuburaya, would find inspiration from the Lucky Dragon event and wanted to make a movie about the effects of nuclear weapons. Sadly, there was a law that passed which banned war movies from being made in Japan after World War II. So instead of making a film like that, they looked to another inspiration. Honda was greatly inspired by the original King Kong and figured their film should become a monster movie where the monster is the main cause of destruction, while also radiating nuclear energy after it was mutated by nuclear bomb tests. After several designs and artists were brought in to create the look of the monster, they finally landed on a design that had a T-Rex-like body with large dorsal spines on its back. After careful consideration, the name of the monster was finally decided, which was Gojira, which translates to Godzilla if you didn't know. There is a pretty famous story with Godzilla fans that Gojira was actually the name of a heavyset employee that almost everyone in Toho gave the nickname Gojira, which is a word that's a combination of the Japanese terms for whale and gorilla. Wow. Which is a funny story and stood as the main source of the Gojira name for years. Even I believed the story for a good while. However, in Happy Dragon Pictures Godzilla review, he played a clip of where Ashiro Honda's widow said she never believed the story, and said that her husband, Tanaka, and Tsuburaya probably came up with the name after careful consideration instead. Really, just believe what you want to believe at this point. Also, watch Happy Dragon Pictures review after watching mine. It is, like, the best Godzilla review analysis ever made by a non-fan, which is crazy. So that was the origin of Godzilla, but what's the actual movie like? Well, it opens with a fishing boat being attacked by a giant monster, directly taken from the Lucky Dragon incident as I mentioned earlier. 
After the boat incident in the film, the people of Tokyo are perplexed as to what caused the destruction of said boat, along with a few more encounters of the civilians with a giant monster, which ends up being given the name Gojira, or Godzilla. What's interesting about this first movie in comparison to the over 30 follow-ups is that this is one of the very few that takes itself incredibly seriously. The fictional incidents in the movie aren't over the top like other ones. It still gets me whenever I rewatch this movie. With other Godzilla movies, I just sort of pop them in to rewatch the fun monster fights. But for the first movie, I really have to be in the right mood to rewatch it. It does an amazing job at building suspense. And surprisingly enough, we don't get to see Godzilla until around the 21 and a half minute mark. And no real on-screen monster destruction happens until the 54 minute mark. Godzilla's hardly in the film. This movie really plays like a slow burn. So it's also not the easiest to recommend to newbies who have never seen a single one of these Godzilla movies. That's kind of what makes the original movie so unique though. It's almost nothing like the other movies, and that's really helped its legacy grow strong. It's not just a good monster movie, it's a good all-around movie. It's more than just a product of its time. What also helps the film are the human characters. I think I'm one of the rare Godzilla fans who actually doesn't mind the human characters in these movies. Mainly because, like with any other movie, when they're written right, they can be just as entertaining as the monster scenes. The main characters include Dr. Yamani, who's working with the officials on how they could stop Godzilla, Hideto Ogata, who's seen causing an affair with Amiko Yamani, Dr. Yamani's daughter, but who's probably the most important character in this movie is Dr. Sirazawa, a doctor working on numerous experiments, one of which that not only could lead to the demise of Godzilla, but perhaps all of mankind if it's put in the wrong hands. I'm gonna delve into spoiler territory for the human parts right now, so skip to this point in the video if you don't want to get this part spoiled. If you don't care, then... well, okay. If I'm saying these Japanese names wrong, then I'm really sorry. Amiko is supposed to be getting married to Dr. Sirizawa, actually. She does want to break off the marriage, but when she tries to, Sirizawa shows her the deadly experiment he had been working on, of which causes her to become very shocked, as her over-the-top expression may show it. Afterwards, Amiko swears to Sirizawa that she won't speak a word about the experiment to anyone else until she breaks down to Ogata and tells him everything about Sirizawa's experiment. The experiment in question is called the Oxygen Destroyer, which has the ability to disintegrate all oxygen in water and can also reduce living organisms to bone. It's... very out there. But then again, this is the same franchise that'll end up giving us this. <laughs> So whatever, anything's possible. After hearing about this experiment, Ogata realizes that this device can probably be the only thing capable of killing Godzilla. After some hesitation, Sirizawa agrees to use the experiment just this once. After that, he says the oxygen destroyer must never be used again. He even goes as far to burn all the information he made on the creation. So Ogata and Sirizawa head out with the officials to use the oxygen destroyer on Godzilla, who's resting underwater. After placing the device, Ogata gets pulled back up on the ship, but Sirizawa severs his airline, sacrificing himself and wishing Amiko and Ogata a happy life together. Thus, Sirizawa dies with all the information on the Oxygen Destroyer going with him. This is one of the sadder endings to a Godzilla movie. I personally found myself to care a lot about these human characters. Even as a kid when I saw this, I thought, damn, that was sad. It's a compliment to the movie for it getting you to care about these characters enough to the end. It even does an amazing job making you care about Godzilla dying too. All throughout the movie he's this great threat to Tokyo, but then he just suffers a rather rough death which just makes you feel kinda bad for him. He's like a lost animal who's clueless about his surroundings, then he's just killed like that. Poor thing. Let's actually talk about Godzilla himself now. In the first movie, he's mostly portrayed by Harold Nakajima. There was a second actor who donned the Godzilla suit, Katsumi Tezuka, but apparently most of the footage with him in the suit was cut out the movie. What makes their performances as Godzilla impressive is really highlighted when you know the story behind the making and wearing of said suit. In the movie, sure, nowadays Godzilla moves really stiffly and kinda jagged. However, filming in the suit was a total nightmare. Two Godzilla suits were constructed for the film, but the first one didn't even work properly, and the most Nakajima did in it was just topple over while wearing it. The second suit, which is the main one you see throughout the movie, was a little easier to use, but it was still plagued with other issues that affected both actors. 
For starters, they couldn't see out the suit. Their heads were always in the neck of the suit, so they couldn't see shit while they were filming. Not only that, temperatures in the suit would build up over time, and it would get so hot in the suit that Nagajima and Tezuka would pass out on multiple occasions. Not only that, while wearing the suit, they would sweat profusely. So every time they had to swap actors, a cup of sweat needed to be removed from the suit. Gross. I tell you all this because it really helps highlight a lot of the aspects about Godzilla. You can just see the effort both Nakajima and Tezuka put into making sure Godzilla looked good in motion while they were shooting the movie. With the restraints of the suit in mind, thankfully the most Godzilla does in this movie is just walk around and knock a few things over, but even that wasn't easy to film. Bless these two for doing their best, it really paid off in the end. A puppet was also used for most of the close-up shots of Godzilla in the movie, and especially for his first on-screen appearance. The puppet doesn't look too great, but the visual effects, for the most part, are still pretty fascinating to witness. I love how we see Godzilla placed in this scene carefully for his first appearance. I still think it looks impressive. I just love the practical effects work in this movie. People joke that it's just a guy in a rubber suit knocking down cardboard buildings and stuff, but it's the amount of effort that went into these effects that really make it a work of art. I love how they make Godzilla appear large by filming at low angles and shrouding most of the film in darkness. Yeah, yeah, it's in black and white, but I love the look of the movie. It has this haunting presence in it throughout the entire film. It really makes the scenes of Godzilla destroying Tokyo landmarks and buildings a lot more scary, in a way. Another thing that greatly enhances this movie is the film score by Akira Fukube, a composer who would go on to score multiple Godzilla movies after this first one, all the way up to Godzilla vs. Destroya in 1995. What a trooper. His score for the first movie adds a lot to that extra layer of haunting factors throughout the entire film. It really highlights Godzilla's presence amazingly in every scene, and the main theme of the movie is so iconic that it would appear in literally almost every other Godzilla movie. It's an amazing composition, accompanied by Godzilla's vigorous roars and loud stomping, both of which that Afukube created himself. For the stomping, he once knocked over his speakers by accident, but he really liked the sound that it created. So he just recorded himself kicking his speakers. Yeah, that works. And for Godzilla's iconic roar, it was actually created by a Fukube covering a leather glove in some type of lubricant or something, and recorded himself rubbing it against a bass instrument, to which he just simply slowed down the recording of it. That is fucking amazing. This whole movie's pretty amazing. I'd recommend it to anyone who likes old timely movies like this, and if you don't mind watching foreign films in black and white. It's a riveting story, and a great commentary on the use of nuclear weapons and the monsters it could end up creating for mankind. Such a powerful metaphor. Great movie. However, I can't really end this review without mentioning its American cut, the 1956 re-edit, Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Instead of doing the usual thing of poorly dubbing over this movie, for some reason the film production company Joel Enterprises felt the need to film new scenes with American actor Raymond Burr. Not only to have him narrate throughout the entire movie, but also add him to certain scenes in a way to make it seem like he was part of the movie that he wasn't originally in. Let me call. Steve! Steve Martin! Are you badly hurt? Godzilla! Did you hear that? Godzilla! Look at the size of those footprints. Steve! You are a better newspaper man than a linguist. I just got the message that you called. Did you finish with your experiments? Yes. Yeah, it's a valiant effort, if anything. I... I don't like this version of the movie, to be honest. It just messes up the pacing and also screws up the tone of an originally amazing movie. I will say, Raymond Bird does an alright job with the material he's given, the best job he could have done for the type of movie this is. However, when it doesn't come off as jarring, it's kind of... funny? Like, for the wrong reasons? One of the most infamous things about this version is that whenever a character speaks Japanese, Burr has this translator with him to, well, translate. This sounds fine enough, but the filmmakers took advantage of this idea, and instead of giving accurate translations, they just have the translator say whatever the movie wants him to say. Well, that's one way of fixing this awful narrative structure if I've ever seen it. Also, Raymond Burr's character is named Steve Martin, and that just ruins the whole movie. Unintentionally, since Steve Martin was not an actor or comedian until about 8 years after his version of Godzilla came out. But, 
still, I can't take this movie seriously anymore after that. I know there are people who don't mind this version of the movie, but I personally can't get into it. I will, however, thank it for bringing Godzilla into worldwide attention, and also for giving him his famous King of the Monsters title. He truly is the king. The Raymond Burr cut of Godzilla was the only version of the film to be shown outside of Japan for almost 50 years. It wasn't until mid-2004 when a studio named Rialto Pictures finally brought the original Japanese cut of the movie to cinemas in the States and eventually all around the world. Now the US and Japanese cuts of Godzilla are available and are usually sold together, which is nice. So go check out this movie if you were at all fascinated by it by watching my review. In the next review, I'll be looking at this movie's follow-up that came out just five months later. Yeah, that doesn't sound good. For now though, go see the one that started it all. The terrifying, the haunting, the scary, the original Godzilla. So after the smash hit of the original Godzilla, Toho rushed out a sequel just five months later. Godzilla raids again. Remember how at the end of the first movie when Dr. Yamani said if we keep developing nuclear weapons it could lead to another Godzilla being made? Well guess what? It happened again. Oh boy. To be honest, I'm not too crazy about this movie. It's actually one of my least favorite Showa era films. Ashiro Honda had nothing to do with this movie, probably due to its rushed production cycle. At the very least, Tamiyoko Tanaka was still producing it, E.G. Tsuburaya was still doing the effects, but it looks really cheap and not as good as the first. And Akira Fukube didn't compose this movie either. I just get an overall rushed production feel from this film. Toho really dropped the ball for this one. The movie opens with two pilots who are forced to land on an island. And suddenly, look at that! Godzilla's back! And another monster? Whoa! Then we have the same scenes of Dr. Yamane, the only returning character and actor from the first movie, explaining how Godzilla came back and who the other monster is. Somehow they have books on it where they know its name. It's Anguirus, by the way. Godzilla and Anguirus fight a lot. Godzilla kills Anguirus, pretty much. Then they trap Godzilla in ice and that's the end. Movie over. Yeah, if you couldn't tell, I don't care too much about this movie. Not even the human storyline is interesting. This movie just has an overall cheapness to it right down to its monster fights. I guess that is one thing I can't ignore. Raids again marked the first ever time that Godzilla fought another monster. The fan favorite, Anguirus. The fight choreography is... Not great. E.G. Tsuburaya was still doing the effects for this movie, but he did them in a really weird way. A lot of footage gets sped up, which just makes the monster movements look so unnatural and off. The slower shots do fare a bit better, though. Tsuburaya also realized this and would film monster scenes in the future much better later on. Godzilla is once again played by Haro Nakajima, while Anguirus is being played by Godzilla's second suit actor from the first movie, Katsumi Tezuka, which is pretty cool. The two do a fine job, it's just the rushed effects don't really do their scenes any favors. It is entertaining to watch Godzilla fight Anguirus, just not as good as some later monster fights in the future movies. The Godzilla suit was remade to be a bit slimmer and also a little easier to move around in this time, which is great for Nagajima's part, but I really don't like the look of the suit in this movie. It looks too thin. Also, that head is just laughable rather than scary looking. The puppets they used for Anguirus and Godzilla also looked ridiculous. But I do think the head on the Godzilla puppet fares a bit better than the Sumation one. I also really don't like Godzilla's roars in this movie. They sound really rough and not empowering like last time. I don't know, I just never was a fan of it. Not even as a kid. The film score is okay, but without Akira Fukube, this movie just lost a lot of magic that it could have had. It still sounds ominous and tries to be haunting, but when everything else in the movie is not as well put together as the first movie, it really doesn't work as well. There's nothing else for me to really say about Raids again. It's an okay movie, but it's not as entertaining as other movies or as involving as the first movie. As I keep saying over and over again, I apologize. When it's not uninteresting, it's just remaking the first movie again, but with a cheaper budget and not as good scenery around it. I guess watch it if you're at all curious. Next time we'll see Godzilla, he'll be in color and will fight the very monster that inspired his creation in the first place. Until then, I'll see you guys later, and thanks for watching my review. Oh yeah, when Godzilla Raids Again was released in America, for some reason the US distributor not only re-edited the movie, but they also changed the fucking title to Gigantus the Fire Monster? W what? Why? What was the point? That doesn't make sense. So stupid, oh my god. 
So yeah, that was Godzilla Raids again, the actual title of the movie. Watch it, I guess. Hoy vey. King Kong vs. Godzilla, hell yes. This is one of my favorite Godzilla movies. This is the first Godzilla movie to be in color and to also be shot in that fancy new Toho scope. Not only that, we have Ashiro Honda, the director of the first Godzilla movie, back in the directing chair for this one. Plus, Tamioko Tanaka is still producing the movie, and Eiji Tsuburaya is working on the effects once again. Not to mention, hey, the music during the opening sequence sounds pretty amazing. I wonder who did the music for the movie, oh my god. Akira Fukube is back, bitches. The plot of this movie is a lot of fun. A television producer named Mr. Teiko is trying to figure out how to boost his ratings. So he has two of his employees, Asamu Sakurai and Kinzaburo Furo, go on a boat ride to a new island that's near South Island, which hasn't been explored yet. Meanwhile, the American military is in the Arctic regions investigating strange activity coming from one of the icebergs. Huh, I wonder if it has anything to do with the ending of the last movie. Also, because these are American actors being directed by a Japanese director, the acting from almost everyone is pretty awful. But I think it adds to the cheese factor for this movie, and I love it so much. 18 degrees? It can't be. There can't be a warm current running in the Arctic Sea. Check that temperature. Yes, sir! Back with Sakurai and Kinzaburo, they come across a strange land where a group of natives take them captive. They're told to leave mainly because there's a giant monster who roams their island. Might I also add that this is about 20 minutes into the movie and both monsters have not appeared yet, but the human storyline is not boring. It's quite entertaining. This is one of the better written films in the series. You really come to love these characters as you get to know them, and it almost feels like you're on the adventure with them once they're on the island. Of course, at the 26 minute mark, Godzilla breaks free from the iceberg and goes back to rampaging Tokyo. Meanwhile on the island, the natives and her heroes are attacked by a giant octopus, which was pulled off by using a real octopus by the way, only to be saved by the one and only King Kong. Oh by the way, when he's fighting the octopus, he's not fighting the real one, he's fighting like a rubber one, just so you know. Afterwards, Kong just sort of sits down and drinks this weird juice that the natives had collected, which makes him become extremely drowsy. Then the natives chant a song to him which puts him to sleep. Before leaving the island, Sakurai and Kintsuburu decide to capture King Kong and take him back to Mr. Teiko, who's happy that they caught a giant monster since it should boost up his ratings. However, Kong starts waking up during the boat ride back, and they're forced to release them so their ship won't get pulled down by Kong. Afterwards, the movie consists of Kong going around Japan and somewhat reenacting the original 1933 King Kong film. He even picks up a random girl and climbs up a building to get away from the military. It's also discovered that electricity makes Kong stronger, which was not a character trait he always had. But whatever, this version of Kong has superpowers, screw it. At the same time, Godzilla is still roaming around and wrecking shit up, and even has a brief encounter with Kong around the one hour mark. Which by the way, this movie really does not feel its length. At all. That is a huge compliment. Like I said, this first encounter is pretty brief, which sounds a little disappointing since this is supposed to be King Kong vs. Godzilla. However, this wasn't the big fight of the movie. Just you wait. Anyways, Kong climbs a large building. Teiko, Sakurai, and Kinzaburo realize that they could use the same chant that the natives used to put Kong to sleep and stop his rampage. This proves successful. Then a group of soldiers attach Kong's body to a bunch of giant balloons. Then Kong gets taken away by a group of helicopters. This looks absolutely ridiculous. I love this movie. It turns out the helicopters are taking Kong to Godzilla because everyone realizes that Kong is probably the only one who could stop him. And after 1 hour and 25 minutes, King Kong fights Godzilla. And it is a phenomenal fight. It's so damn entertaining. At first, Godzilla fights off Kong without much effort using his atomic breath and powerful strength. So Kong really is at a disadvantage in the fight. Then Kong gets struck by lightning, and the true battle finally begins. Kong swings Godzilla by his tail and just starts wailing on him. Then Kong just shoves a tree down Godzilla's throat. It's hilarious. They trample over a bunch of buildings while pushing onto each other. Then there's that fun shot of them being little hand puppets. And Kong just keeps wailing on Godzilla throughout the fight. Until they reach this pagoda building, which is absolutely destroyed by both of them. It's crazy. Holy shit. I also love how at the beginning of the fight, Godzilla is the one taking charge, but then after Kong gets stronger, Godzilla tries to run away from him. It's such a funny detail. So they destroy the pagoda building, which is a repeating thing in almost every movie, so be on the lookout for that. Then Kong tackles Godzilla into the water, and... there's no queer winner. 
yeah, in a pretty genius ending, they don't show who actually won the fight. Kong does resurface, but you can also just assume that Godzilla swam away from him the second he landed in the water. There was a pretty famous double ending rumor where in the Japanese cut, Godzilla won, but in the American edit, Kong won. This rumor lasted for a really long time, until it was confirmed fake by fans once the internet became bigger and accessibility to these movies became more viable. So who won the fight? That's for the viewer to decide themselves. And that was King Kong vs. Godzilla, a fun little monster movie with one of the greatest monster brawls ever put to screen. Not only are the monster fights fun, but the human characters are great too. Mr. Taiko is a great antagonist type character. He's such a greedy businessman and even risks the lives of all his employees when he argues about releasing Kong. Not only that, but he hates Godzilla. Like, a lot. Basically, he's the opposite of me. He's the type of human character that you just love to hate. He's very entertaining in every scene he's in. There's also Sakurai and Kintsubaru who are great main characters. Like I mentioned earlier, none of the scenes with these two are boring. They're both very likable and do a great job carrying the movie when the monsters aren't on screen. Now let's talk about the two main stars. Godzilla is given a new look in this movie, and I love this design for him. He's quite a thick boy, along with having the most lizard-like head he's ever had. It's one of the best designs he was ever given. One fun fact about Godzilla suits is that each one was given a nickname by Toho whenever they were finished constructing them. So the 1954 suit was called Shodai Goji, and the Raids Again suit was called Gaiakushi Goji. The Godzilla suit in King Kong vs. Godzilla was actually called King Goji, which is awesome. Another thing I love about Godzilla in this movie is how goofy his personality is. This was the first movie to start portraying Godzilla in a much lighter tone. I love how in his first encounter with Kong, he just shoots his atomic breath at him, then he does a little dance and waves his arms around. He's such a bitch. And that's still Hiro Nakajima playing Godzilla, and he must have been having a total blast playing him in this movie. Godzilla's roars are also incredibly good in this one. Some of my favorite Godzilla roars of all time. Check it out. The other star, King Kong, is also a great part of this movie. When it comes to Kong's costume, well, as James Rolfe perfectly put it, it looks like roadkill. However, I still love his goofy look and fun personality. Kong's a blast to see in this movie, and it just gets enhanced whenever he fights Godzilla. He's being played by Shirochi Hiroz, and it seems like he's having a lot of fun here in the same way Nakajima's having fun playing Godzilla. The fights are so well done, much better than the last film. E.G. Tsuburaya did an amazing job with the effects in this movie, along with setting up how the fight between the two monsters would happen. The miniature sets and landscapes that both him and his team put together look incredible and so full of detail. The pyrotechnics are amazing to see too. Kind of incredible how none of the suits caught on fire during the more intense fight scenes. Akira Fukube's film score is incredible. It's bouncy and energetic at points, but it also remembers to be less louder and sinister when needed. The fight music is pretty goofy, but it's still pulled off so well. It just fits the scenery perfectly. This is one of my favorite Godzilla soundtracks by far. It has one of my favorite rearrangements of the Godzilla theme, and the opening credits sound incredible. Afukube really outdid himself here. It's amazing. King Kong vs. Godzilla is a fun, fun monster movie, but like I briefly mentioned earlier, it did have a different American version. This version did have new scenes shot with American actors, and in probably its worst offense, it took out Akira Fukube's amazing film score and replaced it with a bunch of placeholder music from Universal Horror Movies. For horror fans, that's great for them, but for Godzilla fans, we really miss out on an amazing soundtrack. I haven't watched the US cut in full, and I have no real interest in doing so. Sadly, for several decades, the American cut of King Kong vs. Godzilla was the only version of the film to be released in the US. It seemed like the Japanese cut would never be brought over due to legal reasons with Universal owning the distribution rights. All seemed lost, until the Criterion Collection came down from the heavens and gave us the soon-to-be-released Godzilla The Showa Era Films Collection. This very collection will, for the first time ever, have the original Japanese cut of King Kong vs. Godzilla included. The US cut is also there too, so everyone wins. I can't wait for that collection to come out, and I am definitely picking it up whenever I can. Damn the huge price, but it's so worth it. Until then, track down the Japanese cut of King Kong vs. Godzilla anywhere online. <laughs> Archive.org. <laughs>
then sit back and watch a fun Japanese monster movie. I can't recommend this film enough. It's a total blast. The next time we see Godzilla, he'll be fighting against another giant monster who also had their own movie just a few years earlier. Mothra vs. Godzilla. Here we go. Not to be confused with the 1992 movie of a similar namesake. Whenever they brought this movie over to America, for some reason they changed the title to Godzilla vs. The Thing. Yeah... This film acts as not just a sequel to King Kong vs. Godzilla, but also the 1961 movie, Mothra, which was about a giant caterpillar monster named Mothra who gets upset when her twin fairies are kidnapped by a bunch of greedy businessmen. So she goes on a rampage and eventually becomes a fully grown butterfly. The plot of Mothra vs. Godzilla is quite similar. Mothra lays an egg this time, but a hurricane washes it away and causes it to go ashore, where some more greedy businessmen try to make some money off of it. Not only that, the twin fairies try to beg the businessmen to let the egg go, otherwise Mothra is going to become angered yet again. They don't listen to them and attempt to kidnap the fairies, but they escape. The twin fairies end up in the hands of our three main protagonists, who tell them the same story about Mothra wrecking havoc if her egg isn't returned. In fact, she's already here and ready! Oh no! The three try to get the businessmen to listen to their reasoning, but of course all they want to do is just buy the fairies off the three of them. Greedy bastards. So the wrath of Mothra may seem imminent, but the twin fairies mention that Mothra has actually gotten much older since the last movie, and is right on the brink of death. However, she's going to be the only source of hope they have against another problem that literally emerges. What problem? Oh, I don't know, Godzilla? Who rises out the ground and proceeds to destroy Japan some more. Jesus Christ, this is like the most unlucky place on Earth. So it's up to Mothra to use her last bit of energy to stop Godzilla and protect her egg. Because I guess Godzilla wants to eat it for some reason. The plot is enjoyable and a great excuse to see some amazing practical effects work by E.G. Tsuburaya once again. Throughout the movie, we see the military attempting to stop Godzilla. What we get are amazing sequences of a bunch of explosive and multiple projectiles being sent at Godzilla. We already saw similar stuff in previous movies, but this is where it's really the main focus, as Godzilla is shown to be pretty much indestructible. Nothing can bring him down. Tanks, missiles, electric barriers, a giant net, nothing works. He's a literal god. E.G. Tsuburaya did an amazing job with the effects. Perhaps a bit too good of a job because the Godzilla suit actually catches on fire in this movie. Yeah, after a few pyrotechnics, the head actually caught fire for a bit. Thankfully, Haro Nakajima wasn't harmed during it, and to be perfectly honest, it actually looks kinda badass. The only thing that stands a chance against Godzilla is another monster, which is Mothra. It might sound ridiculous for a butterfly to fight Godzilla, but that's only because it is. No, really though, it's actually a pretty decent fight, and it ends with Mothra dragging Godzilla away from her egg. Then after the fight, Mothra goes live by her egg until it hatches, and she sadly dies in the process. Yeah, get used to seeing Mothra die in these movies, because it's sad every single time. Thankfully, her egg hatches and two new baby Mothras are set loose, who go after Godzilla to avenge their mother and put a stop to his rampage. It's really as simple as that. Mothra vs. Godzilla is a really solid entry in the series. It's considered by many fans to be one of the best in the franchise, and I completely agree with that. Along with the greedy businessmen being great antagonists, we also have some pretty solidly written characters as the main heroes, who carry the movie greatly. Not to mention the twin fairies, who are actually played by a vocalist pair called the Peanuts, who both do a really good job in the roles just like they did in the original Mothra. And according to Ashiro Honda, he was pleasantly surprised by how professional they were about being actors, since they were only known as singers and these roles were some of their first acting jobs. Bravo! And they would later go on to reprise the roles in future films. Of course, I gotta talk about Godzilla for a bit again, who's completely brutal in this movie. He's given a new design too, codenamed Masu Goji, and it's the classic Godzilla design that just about looks perfect. Has the right head shape and a good structure all around. Godzilla's scenes, again, mostly consist of demonstrations of how absolutely powerful he is against regular weapons. It's simple, but entertaining which can just about be said about the movie itself. Yeah, I don't really have a whole lot to say about this flick. Just check it out for yourself. It's a good movie and I highly recommend it. That's pretty much it. Great film. 
Ghidra the Three-Headed Monster, another great entry in the Godzilla series, which was released just eight months after Mothra vs. Godzilla. Yeah, both these movies came out the same year, go figure. The plot involves a group of aliens trying to warn the Earth of a great attack by an evil space monster named King Ghidorah. To do this, the aliens take control of a princess and use her to attempt to warn humanity of the attack. However, this princess character is also the center of a group of assassins that are trying to kill her. So yeah, the aliens kind of screwed up right here. Whoops. Oh, and fun fact, one of the human characters is a professor who's played by the same actor who played Dr. Yamani in the first two movies, which is pretty dang cool. Meanwhile, Godzilla returns and starts fighting another giant monster named Rodan who also appeared in his own standalone movie just a few years before this film. So you can almost say this is a sequel to that movie, too. Yeah, Godzilla and Rodan spend most of the movie just fighting each other. There's no real reason why, they just really don't like each other. While this is going on, a meteorite lands in Japan and starts showing some weird activity. Yeah, you can probably put two and two together that this thing contains the space monster, Ghidorah, who eventually breaks out the meteorite and starts wrecking havoc in Tokyo. The only thing capable of stopping Ghidorah are another group of monsters, but Godzilla and Rodan are still fighting each other while Ghidorah is destroying everything. So the only way to bring balance to all of this is another monster, one of Mothra's offspring from the last movie. The other offspring sadly died off screen, so there's only one Mothra now. This leads to my favorite scene in the movie where Mothra tries to reason with Godzilla and Rodan, who initially don't want to help stop Ghidorah to save the Earth because they don't care. This scene is fascinating because this is the first ever time we hear what Godzilla's perspective on humans are, which apparently Rodan agrees with him and they decide to stop fighting each other, but they still don't want to help Mothra. It's interesting to see a bit more of the monster's personalities, and it's all thanks to the fun writing from the dialogue of the twin fairies translating the monster's speech. It's one of the biggest highlights of the whole series to me. So after that talk proves unsuccessful, Mothra heads out to go fight Ghidorah. And... yeah, it doesn't work out too well. Thankfully, Godzilla and Rodan have a change of heart and decide to help defeat Ghidorah. This is where the movie gets real good. It was already pretty solid with its human story and the fights between Godzilla and Rodan were already pretty fun too. But seeing these four monsters go at it is the true highlight of the movie. It's so entertaining. Rodan slams into Ghidorah while flying. Godzilla tosses rocks at Ghidorah, then Ghidorah just zaps Godzilla in the crotch. No joke. It's just an all-around entertaining monster match and one of the most entertaining finales to any of these movies. King Ghidorah would later go on to be in numerous Godzilla movies and would pretty much become Godzilla's arch-rival since he's appeared in pretty much every different era that Godzilla has had a series of movies in. Not to mention Ghidorah, Rodan, and Mothra being in King of the Monsters from earlier this year. With its entertaining human story and fun monster battles, this is another film in the series I could recommend. Especially if you're already binging the series from beginning to end. That's gonna be quite a ride, so I definitely say check out this one too. It's a solid monster flick. Invasion of Astro Monster, also known as Godzilla vs. Monster Zero. The sixth entry in the Godzilla series, and this one becomes more fictional than the others. I mean, it was always fictional, but what I mean is that this one goes full-on science fiction. Space travel was all the rave in the 1960s, so Ashiro Honda figured he can make the next Godzilla film involve space travel. An interesting idea at first, but unfortunately, this movie received a lower budget than the last movies, which ended up affecting the well, effects. Honda was quite disappointed in this since even Godzilla fans at the time complained that the effects didn't look as good, which was probably discouraging to him since this would be the last Godzilla movie he'd direct for a while. Not only was this Honda's stopping point, this would also be the last film to have famed effects director Eiji Tsuburaya do the effects for a Godzilla movie, while he'd stay as a supervisor for later movies up until his death in 1970. Plus, Akira Fukube made this his last Godzilla movie he'd compose for a while too. Jesus, this film was like the end of an era. I should probably start talking about it now. The plot involves astronauts coming in contact with an alien race who beg for the humans to help them fight against the giant space monster they have dubbed Monster Zero, which just so happens to be King Ghidorah. So they ask that two of their monsters, Godzilla and Rodan, to be brought into outer space to fight off Ghidorah and save their alien race. They end up doing just that, and it looks quite ridiculous. I enjoy the camp factor of this movie, but I feel kind of bad after reading about the history of this film, and how Honda and Tsuburaya had to work with a 
smaller budget. I do think they did the best job they could have done. Once Godzilla and Rodan are brought into space, they wake up and are immediately attacked by Ghidorah. This leads to a pretty fun space battle. It's classic monster fighting action, but this time in space! Godzilla even takes advantage of this and body slams King Ghidorah, which is hilarious. After that, Ghidorah flies away in defeat. You know what this calls for? A victory dance. I love that gif. Godzilla and Rodan are returned to Earth, but a twist ends up occurring. It turns out King Ghidorah was under the control of the aliens all along, and they eventually take control of Godzilla and Rodan too, so they set the three monsters loose to try and take over the planet. However, through some scientific way, the humans are able to break the monsters out of the aliens' control, and all three monsters end up in one final battle before Ghidorah flies off to space. Again. The final fight is pretty fun. It's one of the only two scenes in this movie that I get some excitement out of. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest, I'm not really too into this movie. I don't think it's bad, I just think it's... tired. It does feel like the filmmakers really tried to make this bigger and better than the last two movies, but the budget restraints are really obvious in a lot of areas. Fun fact, Honda planned for Mothra to be part of the monster action too, but she had to be cut due to the small budget. It's quite sad. Invasion of Astral Monster was just a sad movie to do research on. It's no wonder Honda, Tsuburaya, and Afukube were discouraged to continue on with these films. Everyone deserves a break, I guess. However, Afukube's score is really good, and a lot of the practical effects on Earth still look fantastic. It's just the space stuff that kind of looks cheap and lifeless in a way. Astral Monster is a decent entry in the series, but I think it just leaves the viewer wanting a little more. But after hearing about the production issues that this movie went through, it makes me understand a little better about why this movie is the way it is. Still, I will praise the filmmakers for trying their hardest with this movie. It wasn't great, but they still made a solid movie. The human story isn't too engaging, though what is interesting is that there's one American actor in the cast this time, Nick Adams. What's also interesting is that in the English dub, he's the only character who isn't getting dubbed over, but his voice is dubbed over in the Japanese cut and you can really tell by how his mouth movements don't match up to his words at all. So yeah, that's a little strange. Apart from that, the two main monster fights are entertaining, so this movie does have a few good things to offer. I'd recommend it, but just take note that the budget got shortened, and it really wasn't the filmmaker's decision. Next time, Honda, Tsuburaya, and Afukube are out, so we're having a set of newbies work on the next movie. At least Tamiyoko Tanaka is still producing these movies. Bless this man. The next movie will be a Godzilla film that I'm actually not too familiar with, so this ought to be interesting. Hopefully. Ebera, Horror of the Deep, also known as Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster. Creative title. This is actually a movie that I didn't watch all the way through until I needed to write this review, so here we go. The plot involves a group of sailors who end up venturing to a native island far away from Japan. Their ship ends up going through a nasty storm, and they're attacked by a giant lobster claw which destroys their ship. Thankfully, they all wake up on the exact island they were looking for, and unfortunately, there's no escaping it. It's heavily guarded by a group called the Red Bamboo, who are doing a bunch of experiments there, and have also enslaved the island natives. Plus, if anyone tries to escape, they're attacked by a giant lobster-looking monster named Ebera. While trying to escape the Red Bamboo, the four main characters and a native girl head into a cave, where they come across Godzilla? What? Why is he here? I don't know, but he's a sleepy boy, and he doesn't wake up for a good while. Obviously, they think Godzilla would be the best thing to fight against Ebera, so they try to find a way to wake him up. Meanwhile, Mothra is also on the island, but she's asleep too. The twin fairies are also in the movie, but they're played by different actresses. A pair called the Pear Bambi. A little disappointing they're not played by the Peanuts anymore, but these two actresses do a decent job. It's not until the 52 minute mark when Godzilla finally wakes up, then the movie gets a little more interesting. This leads to a pretty amusing scene where Godzilla plays volleyball with Ebra using a few boulders. Then they have sort of a mini fight, which is pretty decent. Yeah, the human story isn't too engaging, but the second Godzilla wakes up it feels like this movie finally has something to work with. Though I'm not too sure how to feel about Godzilla's personality in this movie. There are some scenes where he acts like his usual self, but then there's completely out of character moments. Like there's a bit where he has a fascination with the native girl. This doesn't seem like Godzilla. It feels more like something King Kong would do... wait a minute. 
Okay, so apparently this movie was originally going to be starring Kong, but they changed it to Godzilla at the last minute, and didn't bother changing anything else in the script. Which is why Godzilla acts a little differently in this movie. Plus, Godzilla gets woken up by electricity. If we remember in King Kong vs. Godzilla, Kong was powered by electricity. So this adds up to the theory that Kong was supposed to be the star of the movie, not Godzilla. Even then, Godzilla's still the best part of the movie. Though there is one scene where he fights a bird, and the cinematography looks absolutely awful. It's all zoomed in and crappy, probably to try to hide the not-so-great special effects. This was the first Godzilla movie to not have E.G. Tsuburaya as the effects director, and it's kind of obvious. Some of the practical sets look alright, and the fight scenes with Godzilla and Ebra are well staged. Some of the other sets just look... okay. The music is also different, but I wouldn't call it bad. It has a very heavy emphasis on using surfer music, which sort of dates the score in a way, as opposed to the previous composer, Akira Fukube, whose compositions in the previous movies were timeless and memorable. The Ebera soundtrack is very of its time. Not too sure how to feel about that. So, yeah, Ebera Horror of the Deep is an okay movie. It just takes a good while to get to the actual monster action. The fights with Ebera are entertaining. The Godzilla suit was revamped a little, making it fit better for the underwater scenes, it seems. The name of this suit is Daisenso Gaji, and it's also the same suit that they used in Invasion of Astral Monster, in case you wanted to know. Oh yeah, there's also a brief fight with Mothra at the end, but it's incredibly short. This also leads to the island exploding. Oh, spoilers? Yeah, this one wasn't super great, but check it out if you guys were interested, I guess. Next time, we're gonna look at another odd entry in the series, but this one's actually one of my favorites in the franchise, so I'm excited. Son of Godzilla. Oh boy. This is a film that fans either love or hate. I'm sorry to say, but I think I love this movie. It's one of my favorites in the Showa era. It's such a unique movie in the series. Just from the opening, you get a good sense of how the film is gonna play out. The music's all bouncy and whimsical. It just has an infectiously sweet tone to it throughout. Let's start with the plot. A group of researchers are having weather experiments on Infant Island, which is the main location of where all the monsters live, including Godzilla. It's also inhabited with giant mantises who terrorize the researchers on multiple occasions. One day, the researchers end up finding a giant egg on the island, that the mantises start to break apart. Inside is a little baby monster that the mantises continue to bully and harm. That is, until Godzilla shows up to beat the ever-living shit out of the mantises. Yeah, that's right, the baby is Godzilla's. He's a daddy now. I love this design for Godzilla because he looks so goofy. This suit was dubbed Masuko Goji, but I love referring to this design as Momzilla, since Godzilla's a parent now. Yeah, let's start calling this design that name. Deal? Cool. What's also important to notice is that this was the first Godzilla movie where Haro Nakajima was not playing Godzilla most of the time. He does play Godzilla in all the water scenes, but when on land, Misuko Gaji is being played mainly by another actor, Hiroshi Sakita. While I'm usually against another actor playing the big G, Hiroshi actually does a really solid job, so I commend him for taking this role from such a legendary suit actor like Nakajima. He's a good replacement. Nakajima and Hiroshi would actually play side by side in another movie called War of the Gargantuas. Also, I think Nakajima couldn't be in the entire movie because he was already busy playing King Kong in another movie that got released the same year as this one, King Kong Escapes. But I'm getting off topic right now. Anyways, Godzilla beats the crap out of the mantises for harming his son, but then he slams him with his own tail then walks away. Wow, Godzilla's kind of a mean dad. While Godzilla's away, his son, who's called Minya by the way, comes across a native girl who gives him some fruit that'll make him grow up big and strong. Eat your veggies, kids. After that, Godzilla returns and lets Minya hop on his tail for a little ride. Oh. Some time goes by and Minya grows up a little, and is also being taught a few lessons by his dad. This leads to my most favorite scene in the movie, and also one of my favorite scenes in the whole franchise. In a really amusing scene, we see Godzilla teaching his kid how to roar, He also teaches him how to shoot his atomic breath, which at first freaks Minya out, which I always found really cute.
Godzilla is super harsh on Minya, but does seem encouraging towards teaching him these things. At first, Minya can only puff little smoke rings, until Godzilla steps on his tail, then he can blast his full atomic breath at max. This is such an adorable scene. It may seem like they jumped the shark by making Godzilla apparent in this movie, but I praise the filmmakers for coming up with such an outlandish idea, and I love it so much. I never thought seeing Godzilla as a dad would be so entertaining. There's a few fun scenes of Godzilla and Minya interacting that I just love. I love the scene where Godzilla's trying to sleep, and Minya's playing jump rope with his tail. It's such a pointless part of the movie and doesn't affect the plot at all. The filmmakers didn't need to add this in, but they did it anyways, and I love it. Little scenes like this can really make me love this movie even more. In a way, it actually adds more to the world building in the series. But while all of this is going on, a giant arachnid monster named Kamunga is set loose. And to all the arachnophobes watching right now, I am terribly sorry. Kamunga is one freaky ass looking monster. Kamunga goes around webbing up everything and eating all the mantises in the process, along with terrorizing the researchers while they're working. And eventually this leads to Kamunga attacking Minya too. And you know Godzilla ain't gonna let that shit slide. And he doesn't. So he sets his son free from the webbing, and both of them team up to use their atomic breath to shoot Kamunga to death, who dies by crumbling like an actual spider does. That's such a weird and creepy detail, but I find it so fascinating that the filmmakers had Kamunga die this way. Again, they didn't need to do that, but they did it anyways. During this, the weather experiment the researchers were working on ends up being a success. An infant island gets covered in heavy snowfall. This leads to another scene that's always stuck with me since I was a kid. While Godzilla is intimidating the snow coming down, Minya keeps falling down, and at a point ends up looking visibly sad. To which Godzilla walks up to him, lifts him up, then embraces him as the snowfall continues. Without any dialogue, you completely understand what's happening in this scene. And that's brilliant. This is one of the most touching endings to a Godzilla movie, and it's one that'll definitely stick with me until the end of time. Son of Godzilla is a fun, weird, but very sweet monster movie. It's one of the most outlandish ideas ever put into these movies, but I think the delivery of said idea was done very well. I really love all the fun scenes with Godzilla and Minya interacting. The stuff with the humans is also pretty interesting, the monster fights are spectacular to view, and even the soundtrack is full of a lot of range from it being bouncy and whimsical at the start, to even being scary near the end, and downright beautiful during the final scene. This might have been a dumb concept, but it's still one of my favorite Godzilla movies. I recommend it based off personal preference alone. So if you're someone who likes Godzilla movies and also has a hardened soul, check this one out. It's a really sweet movie that's just entertaining all throughout. Not bad for the now 8th entry in the Godzilla series. Next time, we're going to be looking at a movie that was initially planned to be the end of all the monster action from Toho. Destroy All Monsters. Awesome title. What was originally meant not just to be the last Godzilla movie, but also the last Monster Mash production by Toho. So to go all out, they brought back Ashiro Honda to direct, Akira Fukube to compose, and even E.G. Tsuburaya to work on the effects with the current effects director. They really wanted this to be the end, but obviously plans changed, but we'll cover the other movies later. In this timeline, all the monsters are safe and secure on Infant Island. And when I say all the monsters, I mean all the monsters. This includes Godzilla and his son, Rodan, Mothra, another monster named Gorosaurus, Anguirus, wait, isn't Anguirus supposed to be dead? Then again, Kamunga is also in this movie, and he literally died in the last film, so I guess anything's possible in this series. The movie also takes place in the future, the year 1999. Okay, it's not the future anymore, but you know what I mean. The plot involves a group of astronauts who come in contact with an alien race who decide to mind control all the monsters and set them loose on numerous locations on Earth. Yeah, it's pretty much the plot of Invasion of Astro Monster again, but done on a much larger scale. This is actually where I think the movie goes a little downhill. Most of the movie is just about the humans trying to stop the aliens from controlling the monsters in order to stop all the destruction. It's not super interesting, being perfectly honest. And that's coming from someone who usually doesn't mind the human parts of these monster movies. We do get to see the monsters destroy all sorts of cities on Earth, but they're very few in between, and I think the movie could have used a little more scenes with the monsters. 
Thankfully, my wish gets granted around the end of the movie, as all the monsters end up on Mount Fuji together, and then King Ghidorah appears out of nowhere. Why? Who cares? We got us an awesome monster fight coming up! This is the big highlight of the movie, and I wish we had more monster fights like these earlier. The ending battle is so entertaining and it's great just seeing all these monsters share screen time together. You can really tell that Ashiro Honda and the rest of the crew were just having fun with this final battle. I like the bit where Anguirus chomps on Ghidorah's neck, then gets lifted in the air, then he gets dropped, and god, seeing the ground crumble after Anguirus' impact, such a great detail. Then Godzilla and the other monsters team up and ambush Ghidorah, and they plummet that bastard into the ground. Godzilla stomps on one of Ghidorah's necks, Anguirus takes care of another one of the heads, and even Minya gets to strangle the last living head with his puff ring. God, they are just so relentless on that some bitch. It's great. And that's the end of King Ghidorah, at least in this timeline. After that, Godzilla kicks into the alien base, basically destroying it, and that's the end of the movie. I love the last shots of Godzilla and the rest of the crew on Infant Island. If this was going to be the last monster movie by Toho, I'm glad they thought of doing the ending like this with shots of all the monsters pretty much saying goodbye to the camera. It's rather touching. Destroy All Monsters is a decent movie, but it just drags on with the human plot for a little too long for my liking. It just needed a bit more monster action, but if anything, that fight at the end is a lot of fun to watch. Could have used more of that. I would recommend this movie, but I'd really say just skip to the end, and I know I'm not the first one to say that. I will say I love the new Anguirus suit and the new design that Godzilla got in this movie. It's called Sojingeki Goji, and it's going to be used in multiple movies. So much so that it's literally falling apart in Godzilla vs. Gigan, but I'm not there just yet. Anyways, Destroy All Monsters is an alright movie. It has an okay human story, some solid monster action, but a fantastic score by Akira Fukube and a phenomenal final battle near the end. I recommend it, but again, skip to the monster mash at the finale. So while this film was intended to be the grand finale, for whatever reason, they decided to keep going with Godzilla movies. I don't mind. But the next movie? <sighs> Probably the weakest in the Showa era. All Monsters Attack, or Godzilla's Revenge as it's more famously known as. First off, both those titles are awful. Second, this movie is not very good. Even though Ashiro Honda did direct this one, I have no clue what the filmmakers were thinking when they made this movie. The film follows some random kid who's a huge fan of Godzilla, so much so that he gets bullied at school for it. Relatable content. Then the kid gets kidnapped by these mobsters who hold him hostage. Okay, who cares? Where are the monsters? Well, while the kid's kidnapped, he goes into these dreams where he imagines being friends with Minya, the son of Godzilla. In these imaginations, Minya has the ability to grow and shrink at any point. Plus he could talk, by the way. And he's also trying to face another giant monster, Gabara, who acts less like a scary monster and more like a skull bully. Get it? It's a metaphor. Also, Gabara looks and sounds incredibly stupid. I'm honestly glad Godzilla throws that douchebag in the air. Wait, we're not at that part yet. While that's going on, Minya and the kid go watch old clips of Godzilla movies. Wait, you mean the stock footage is meant to be part of the story? Oh. Oh no. Yeah, this movie kind of shamelessly uses stock footage for about half the scenes with Godzilla in it. It's almost like you're watching a Best of Godzilla clip show, but it's made even worse by how the Godzilla suit looks different in every scene they do this in. It really doesn't work. You're probably thinking, well, is there any new fights in the movie? Yeah, kind of. The last bit of monster action we see is Minya facing Gabra again. This time though, Godzilla joins the action, but at first instead of stopping Gabra himself, Godzilla encourages Minya to fight Gabra instead. Um, what? Doesn't help that Gabra has electricity powers and shocks Minya multiple times. Eventually, Godzilla joins the fight and beats the fucking crap out of Gabra. Thank god. After that, the kid escapes the mobsters in real life, then he stands up to the bullies by beating them up. What a great message for kids to learn from this movie. Clearly, violence is the only answer. Bullshit. All Monsters Attack is lame. It's a lame movie with an annoying kid, an even more annoying monster, really lazily placed stock footage, and a really oddly jazzy film score. It's just... not a good movie. 
I understand it's trying to be for kids, but I don't think they went about the right ways of making this movie that way. The effects during the Godzilla vs. Gabra fight are decent, but nothing spectacular. We thankfully won't see Gabra again after this movie, so that's a decent positive I could give it. But still, for the 10th movie in the series, and also coming out during the 15th anniversary of Godzilla, man, this was disappointing. This is the first Godzilla movie I simply cannot recommend. Skipping it won't affect anything, it's that unimportant. Easily is Shiro Honda's worst Godzilla movie. Kind of fitting that he directed both the best and the worst films in the Showa era. Kind of like with Invasion of Astro Monster. I wonder if the reception of this movie also affected Honda too, because he wouldn't return to direct another Godzilla movie for about six years. Poor guy. That's about all I have to say about All Monsters Attack. Don't bother watching it. The next movie, however, I can't really recommend, or also not recommend? Yeah, it's quite bizarre. I don't even, like, know how to start talking about this movie. I guess the backstory? So after Ashiro Honda's All Monsters Attack was a huge dud for most fans, the series lay dormant for a good two years. There wasn't a single Godzilla movie made in 1970, breaking the annual release pattern that these movies had going since 1964. I think a factor as to why it took a while to make another Godzilla movie is probably because of the death of E.G. Tsuburaya, who passed away in January 1970. It must have been quite a sad time for Toho after losing one of its greatest employees. It took a good year for another movie to finally be put in production. First time director Yoshimitsu Bano was hired to create the next movie, but was given a lower budget and a 35 day shoot schedule. It should also be noted that producer Tamiyoko Tanaka was in the hospital for most of the production of Godzilla vs. Hedera, and had to rely on Ashiro Honda to look at what Bano was doing and give him some advice whenever he needed it. The idea for Godzilla vs. Hedera was created whenever Yoshimitsu saw all sorts of polluted areas in Japan, so he wanted to have his Godzilla movie include an environmentalist message in it. Right down to the idea that Godzilla's adversary, Hedera, was literally born from pollution. Yep, that's the plot. Water and other parts of Japan have been heavily polluted, and it creates a giant monster named Hedera who starts terrorizing the city of Tokyo. So it's up to Godzilla who shows up to stop the pollution and defeat Hedera. That would be the end of the plot discussion, but there's a whole lot more weird shit in this movie to point out. It has these weird animation sequences showing Hedera consuming fuels from ships, and there's also other animation bits that are just, like, what the fuck is this movie doing? I really don't understand. Then there's a bunch of trippy music going on whenever Godzilla appears. It's not the Godzilla theme and it sounds nothing like it. It's a very weird direction. Godzilla has a few encounters with Hedera, but each one is just really weird. Hedera is a disgusting monster, and just shoots nothing but filth at Godzilla. It's nasty. Then there's this musical number of some lady singing about protecting the environment and other shit. This is how the opening credits are done, and it's just... weird. Like, you really just gotta see this movie for yourself to really try to understand what I'm describing. There's a scene where a guy is hallucinating in a club that everyone is wearing fish masks. It serves no real purpose in the actual movie, and it's so damn weird. Why is this here? I was right in the middle of a fucking reptile zoo. And somebody was giving booze to these goddamn things. At the very least, Godzilla and Hedera get plenty of screen time in this movie, but they barely really fight each other most of the time. Hedera can also fly? What the fuck even is this monster? The last 30 minutes just consists of one of the most bizarre monster fights I've ever seen in a Godzilla movie, and that's saying a lot. Hedera can also shoot lasers, because of course he can, why not? The military's also trying to help stop Hedera, and attract him to these electric field barriers that'll do... something to disintegrate him. Then Godzilla shows up and messes with Hedera's body to make sure he's actually dead. Then he pulls out these two white balls? What? What are these, and why? Okay, well, they disintegrated. What now? So Godzilla tosses a rock at the Hedera corpse, but it turns out Hedera's still alive and just flies away. So Godzilla decides to fly after him. Yes, Godzilla flies. I'm not making this up. A director sat down, wrote this scene, he envisioned it in his head, and here it is, on the silver screen. This is actually happening right now. Okay. So after that, Godzilla just beats the literal crap out of Hedera, causes him to disintegrate again, and then... Godzilla just rips into him and pulls out all his polluted guts and shit, like... Ew. What is this movie doing? 
Like, honestly, this is just me describing all the monster scenes, but there's a lot of just weird fucking shit spread throughout this movie. Anyways, after Godzilla defeats Hedera, he just... leaves. Fuck it, he deserves to. This movie was so damn weird. Godzilla vs. Hedera is one of the most bizarre things I've ever watched. I agree with protecting the environment and all, but this movie went about the weirdest goddamn way of trying to convey this. I wouldn't watch this to help myself feel good about protecting the environment. The only reason I'd rewatch this movie is just to have a bizarre experience for the next 85 minutes. That's what this movie is. It's not a movie. It's an experience. This is why I say I can't really not recommend it, because I honestly think that everyone on the planet should watch this movie at least once in their lives, just for the weird experience it offers. With its weird editing, goofy music, and just oddball scenes, this is such an outlandish and bizarre entry in the Godzilla series. I guess this is what 10 sequels can really do to a franchise. Yikes. You know who didn't like this movie so much? Tamiyoko Tanaka. He actually hated this movie, and even went as far to tell Yoshimitsu Bano that he, quote, ruins Godzilla. Damn, that's rough. What's sad is that even though Yoshimitsu was banned from directing another Godzilla movie ever again, he was really hoping that a hetero sequel would end up happening. He even mentioned this as recent as 2014 that he still wanted to make it. He stayed pretty prominent about making it for a good while, until he sadly passed away in 2017. The Hedera sequel was never made and probably won't see the light of day, ever. What a way to end this journey of a weird fucking movie. I'm moving on before this film does more weird shit to my brain after melting it already. Next time, we're gonna sadly talk about another stinker in the Godzilla series. Godzilla vs. Gigan, a pretty weak entry in the series. The original idea for this movie is that it was going to be called King Ghidorah's Great Counterattack, and it would have starred Godzilla, Anguirus, and Varen fighting against Ghidorah and two new monsters, Gigan and Magu. Then it was reworked into Godzilla vs. the Space Monsters, which still had Godzilla and Anguirus, but they were teaming up with a new character named Majin Tol, and the three were going to fight against Ghidorah, Gigan, and Megalon. Yes, Megalon was going to appear in this movie. Until the script got reworked one final time, which ended up cutting out both this Majin monster and Megalon from the final movie. As we all know, Megalon would appear in the next Godzilla movie, Godzilla vs. Megalon. Plus, this Majin Toe character would later be changed to King Caesar in Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, but we're not at these films quite yet. The plot of Godzilla vs. Gigan involves a cartoonist who gets involved with figuring out that one of his agencies is a group of evil cockroach aliens that are trying to destroy the world using King Ghidorah and Gigan. So it's up to Godzilla and Anguirus to show up and stop them, while the humans are also trying to find a way to stop the cockroaches. Yeah, this is kind of a weird plot. Not weirder than the last movie, but it's still very out there. Oh, and the cockroaches want to destroy the planet because of all our wars, and because of pollution? Well, I guess they just needed to tie this in with the last movie somehow. Ghidra and Gigan are also being controlled by the cockroaches as well, so that's a thing. That's pretty much the whole plot in a nutshell. Okay, I think my biggest problem with this movie is how slowly paced it is. It takes forever for any monster fighting action to occur. Gigan, who's apparently the main baddie in the movie, doesn't even appear until about 45 minutes in. Even then, the monster fights themselves are kind of underwhelming. I think it just feels tired, really. I mean, this was the 12th entry in the series, so I guess what else could they have done that would have been more interesting? Well, the movie does try to do a few new things, I guess. For starters, we see the monsters have actual dialogue. Yeah, they have little speech bubbles that pop up and tell us what they're saying. It's really odd to see. I have no idea why these were necessary. Another thing that's a little unnecessary is that when Godzilla and Anguirus talk, their roars sound like they're being rewound on a record player. Why did they do that? This happens multiple times in the movie too. Also, in America, they changed the title to Godzilla on Monster Island, which is the main location where all the monsters live that I mistakenly called Infant Island in a few past reviews. So I apologize for that. But anyways, you want to know how the American cut worked around these speech bubble scenes? They didn't bother translating them, so they decided to just remove them and actually have the monsters talk. <laughs> What the fuck? 
Why did they do that? It just sounds so stupid. So after 58 minutes in, Godzilla and Anguirus arrive to fight Ghidorah and Gigan. Like I said earlier though, it's not very entertaining. It's all slow and monotonous. It's just not all that fun watching a slow fight. You also may be wondering, how is Ghidorah alive when Godzilla and company bodied that bastard and Destroy All Monsters? Well, Destroy All Monsters took place in 1999, but I'm pretty sure Godzilla vs. Gigan is set in 1972, the year the movie came out. So there's that exclamation if you wanted it. Okay, let's talk about Gigan, who's actually one of my favorite Godzilla monsters, even though his debut movie kinda sucks. I just love his overall design. Those metal hooks for hands and feet is an interesting choice. Plus that buzzsaw on his stomach looks rad. Not to mention, I really like his roar. It sounds so mechanical and perfect for his character. It's pretty odd to see Gigan be the monster Godzilla is mainly facing in this movie, Especially considering Ghidorah is here, and is usually the main baddie for Godzilla to face. Fun fact by the way, Gigan is being played by Kenpachiro Satsuma, who would later go on to play Godzilla in the Heisei movies. Interesting to see he got his start in these early 70s movies. He was even playing Ghidorah in the previous movie. But back to Gigan. Oh, those hooks in that buzzsaw? Those ain't for show, he uses them. He actually causes Godzilla to bleed. What the fuck? Yeah, he scrapes his shoulder and pokes his head, then Godzilla starts bleeding. Why was this necessary? Anguirus even bleeds. He runs straight into Gigan's buzzsaw. Ew. Was this really important to show? This movie is so odd. What's even odder is that it's using stock footage from previous movies, mainly due to budgetary reasons. And no, it doesn't work. It's about as bad as when they did this in All Monsters Attack. However, it does have one fight highlight. Godzilla holds Ghidorah in place, and Anguirus flies his spikes at Ghidorah's stomach. That was pretty amusing. It's like the only part of this fight that I enjoyed. The rest of it is just, as I said, slow and boring. It just looks so jagged and tired. Plus, the Godzilla suit's even falling apart. You can see parts of it dangling off. Jesus Christ guys, I think it's time for a new suit. I love this design and all, but I think it just needs to be retired. It clearly can't hold out for much longer. Is the movie's soundtrack any good? Well, you may notice on Wikipedia that Akira Fukube was listed as the composer, which sounds great at first, However, the only reason why he's credited is because Toho couldn't afford to make a new score for the movie, so they just recycled a bunch of music from their older movies to save money. God damn it. Though ironically, the soundtrack is probably the best part of the movie. Another thing, this is also the last Godzilla movie where Haro Nakajima played Godzilla. He'd retire from the role afterwards, and if I recall, I think he was quoted once saying he wasn't having as much fun playing the role anymore after E.G. Tsuburaya stopped being the effects director. Kind of sad that he chose to stop at this shitty movie of all choices, but then again, he had been playing the role almost constantly for nearly two decades. He deserved to retire. So thank you, Hiro Nakajima, for your service as being the original Godzilla suit actor. Your legacy may be remembered for ages, and may you rest in peace. Yeah, there's nothing else to say about Godzilla vs. Gigan, other than that it's a lazy and odd movie in the series that I just can't recommend watching. Maybe if you're having bad insomnia and need a movie that'll put you to sleep, then I guess give this a watch. I could barely make it through this movie on a first time viewing, and sure as hell couldn't stand watching it a second time. It's a weak entry in the series, don't watch it, just skip it. The next movie I'll be looking at is actually the first Godzilla movie I ever looked up and watched for myself over a decade ago. So it's kind of a special movie to me. Godzilla vs. Megalon, the 13th entry in the series. 13 can be seen as an unlucky number, but this movie's actually a little better than the last two. Just a little. The movie was initially going to be about a robot named Jet Jaguar, which was a character submitted to a contest Toho put together. While Jet Jaguar is still in the movie, Godzilla was thrown in because they thought it would be more profitable. Without enough preparation, including constructing a new Godzilla suit in just one week and not even having a ready screenplay until the last minute, the movie went into production and only finished filming in about three weeks. Yeah, Vs. Megalon was a rushed film, and it does kind of show in the final result. The plot involves a bunch of nuclear bombs going off that have been disturbing an undersea civilization called Seatopia. They hate the bomb tests so much that they send their giant monster, Megalon, up to the surface to destroy pretty much everything. Yeah, that's one way to take care of the bomb tests. 
If you remember, Megalon was originally going to appear in the last movie, but he was cut out of later drafts and eventually was used for this movie instead. He's got an interesting design. He's like a giant bug monster, and apparently this suit was so heavy for the actor to handle. It was reportedly the heaviest suit made for a Godzilla movie since the original Godzilla suit. Wow. So with Megalon destroying everything, the main human characters put together a robot named Jet Jaguar, who they use for it to go call for Godzilla so both of them can team up to stop Megalon. The human story isn't too interesting, being honest. Some bad guys take control of Jet Jaguar, but they eventually resolve that around the 50 minute mark, and Jet Jaguar heads out to stop Megalon on his own at first, with Godzilla on his way to help. Seeing Jet Jaguar as a threat, the Seatopians called a space hunter Nebula M and asked them if they could use Gigan to fight Jet Jaguar with Megalon. How nice of them to let them borrow their monster. So Gigan and Megalon team up and beat up Jet Jaguar. Then Godzilla shows up to stop them and teams up with Jet Jaguar and the monster mash of the movie finally begins. It's a great fight. Much better than the last movie for sure. Godzilla just punches the hell out of Gigan and Megalon, while Jet Jaguar gets a few good hits in there too. There's a moment where Megalon traps Godzilla and Jet Jaguar in a fire circle, and both him and Gigan are just making fun of them like they're a bunch of bullies. Oh yeah, and the Godzilla suit caught on fire in a few shots during that. We don't see that happen too often. So Godzilla and Jet Jaguar get out of that fire trap and continue beating up the two baddies. It's just a fun little monster mash, much faster paced than previous fights, but that actually helps it a lot. The one thing that kind of stinks about this fight is the use of stock footage, but thankfully they're just a few brief clips. Though I really didn't need to see Godzilla bleeding again. There's a fun bit where Jet Jaguar tosses Gigan up in the air, and Godzilla fries him with his atomic breath. It's awesome. And that's actually what makes Gigan just give up and piss off back to space. Yeah, see you around, you chicken hookbot. Then probably the most hilarious part of this movie happens. Godzilla has Jet Jaguar hold Megalon in place, and then does... this. <laughs> Holy shit, that was awesome. Then guess what? We get to see it happen again! Yay! It's so ridiculous to see, but I love that shit! It's so wacky and crazy! After that godlike move, Megalon just flies away in defeat. Hell yeah, we won. Jet Jaguar thanks Godzilla for his help, and that's kind of the end of the movie. Godzilla vs. Megalon is a lot of fun. While I mentioned the human story isn't too interesting, it's also not too horribly boring either. The monster fight is the true highlight, and I do recommend checking that out because it's the best part of the movie. I gotta say, the Godzilla design may have been rushed, it was apparently the fastest Godzilla suit ever built, but I love the face on the suit. Godzilla looks like a puppy. The suit was called Megaro Goji, and it's one of my favorites. It was also the first Godzilla design I was ever introduced to, since this was the first Godzilla movie I ever looked up and actually watched in full. Yeah, back when YouTube didn't have copyright strikes up the ass and people would just upload movies in full through multiple parts. Those were the days. So I kind of do have some nostalgia at play for this movie, which is why I'm going pretty easy on it. It's just a fun little monster movie and I recommend checking this one out. Though interestingly enough, while Godzilla was added in to make the movie more money, the film actually only sold 980,000 tickets in Japan, making it one of the first Godzilla movies not to sell over a million tickets, which is quite sad. However, it fared a little better in the States since it made over $300,000 in its first three days in Texas and Louisiana alone. Interesting. I'm guessing the poster of the two monsters on top of the World Trade Center really helped sell the movie. This poster is ridiculous, and the proportions of the monster sizes do not add up. Why did they make this poster? Well, if it helped sell more tickets, which it kinda did, then I guess it worked. My grandpa also took my dad to go see this movie in theaters as well. Yeah, I just felt like sharing that. Anyways, Godzilla vs. Megalon isn't technically good, but I still think it's a fun movie and I would recommend checking it out over the last two movies in the series. Next time, we're gonna look at another pretty solid entry in the franchise. The original Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, not to be confused with other movies of similar titles. This is a great entry in the series, and it's one of my definite favorites as well. It was made in 1974, the 20th anniversary of Godzilla, so you know they weren't gonna mess this one up. The plot involves a prophecy being told about a giant monster being sent to destroy the world, but two other monsters will stand up and fight against it. The monster in question turns out to be... Godzilla? What? 
Wasn't he being portrayed as a hero in the last couple of movies? How strange. Anyways, Godzilla shows up and starts wreaking havoc. He then stumbles across Anguirus, and the two have a pretty decent fight. It ends with Godzilla ripping Anguirus' jaw open, which is pretty gory. I always felt so bad for Anguirus here, and this would end up being his last scene he'd ever be in until Godzilla Final Wars. Poor little guy. What a way to go out. Also, during the fight, Anguirus scrapes off a piece of Godzilla's skin, and we see a shiny piece of metal underneath it. What? Hmm... Anyways, Godzilla goes off and starts destroying a city. While doing so, he comes across... Godzilla? What? That's right, this Godzilla was a fake all along, and the real Godzilla is just as confused as we are. So Godzilla breaks off more of the skin on the fake Godzilla, until it finally reveals itself to be none other than Mecha Godzilla. A robot adversary of Godzilla who's loaded with laser eyes and a lot of firepower that actually puts Godzilla out of commission for a good while. We then go back to focusing on the humans, who thankfully aren't too boring in this movie. It turns out Mecha Godzilla was constructed by a group of space apes from outer space. Yep, space apes, who reveal their true form whenever harmed or killed. It's pretty bonkers. Later on, we see Godzilla again, but he keeps getting struck by lightning. Jeez, this just hasn't been his movie. Meanwhile, there's this special statue that the space apes were trying to go after, but it's used to break apart a mountain that's containing the third monster in the movie, King Caesar, who is a sleepy boy. It turns out he has to be sung to to be woken up, which one of the main characters does for him. This song lasts about 4 minutes, as opposed to what other people claim it lasts for. It's nowhere near as long as James Rolfe made it out to be. Trust me. After being sung to, King Caesar wakes up to a massive explosion. Epic. Then King Caesar goes to fight Mechagodzilla, which doesn't end super well. But luck has it, Godzilla returns to join the battle, and the true monster rumble occurs. This final battle is entertaining as hell. It shows off a lot of Mechagodzilla's firepower as he unloads all sorts of missiles and bombs on Godzilla and King Caesar, but the two continue fighting on to defeat Mechagodzilla. Mechagodzilla then creates a force field that burns Godzilla's hands. He really doesn't get it too easy in this fight. It reaches a point where Mechagodzilla causes Godzilla to start bleeding profusely. Jesus Christ! Then he gets a bunch of missiles stabbed into him. God, it's so violent. I love it. Then, after all of that, Godzilla does a complete U-turn and turns himself into a super magnet. How? Why? Who knows? Who cares? He makes Mecha Godzilla get stuck to him and Godzilla lets King Caesar take a few hits on him. I love seeing the heroes win. Then Godzilla twists Mecha Godzilla's head off and it ends with a glorious explosion. Also, the space apes get defeated as well. Caesar goes back to bed, and Godzilla heads back to the ocean. Yay, happy ending! Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla is a spectacular movie. It has an entertaining human story with great pacing, and a lot of fun monster fights throughout. It may get a bit gory for some, but I just found this movie so enjoyable to watch. The soundtrack is absolutely outlandish, but it completely fits the movie so well. This is one of the crazier Godzilla movies, but that's what makes it so great. I recommend checking this one out. It's a bomb, and it was followed by a direct sequel afterwards. Terror of Mechagodzilla, the sequel to Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, and the final film in the Showa era of Godzilla movies. I'm going to assume this was meant to be the end at the time because Ashiro Honda returned to grace this movie and also Akira Fukube. Yeah, they brought him back to do the soundtrack. Yes, this is going to be great. I love how the movie opens with flashback footage of the first Mechagodzilla movie, almost like a previously on Godzilla segment. The plot involves the aliens returning and rebuilding Mechagodzilla to destroy Japan once again. This time they team up with an evil scientist named Dr. Mifune, who wants to destroy all of humanity. Fun fact, Dr. Mifune is played by Hakakiko Karada, who's appeared in multiple Godzilla movies, including playing Dr. Sirizawa in the original Godzilla. Wow! Cool to see him and Ashiro Honda working together again. Also fitting that he plays a scientist in the first and last movies. One benefit about teaming up with Dr. Mifune is that he's taken over the mind of a giant monster, Titanosaurus, an aquatic monster that Mifune and the aliens used to destroy cities with Mechagodzilla. Godzilla doesn't appear in the actual movie until about 45 minutes in, which sounds like a long time, but trust me when I say it is hella worth the wait. Titanosaurus is set loose to destroy a few cities, but during his rampage, a silhouette appears in the distance to which one of the most badass introductions ever occurs. Watch. Yeah. 
there he is. There's the boy. Here to take back his ground. Prepare to eat shit, Titanosaurus. This was honestly one of the best moments in the franchise. Holy shit. Oh yeah, the human plot. Dr. Mifune's daughter, Katsura, ends up getting killed. Dr. Mifune is upset by this, so he revives her by turning her into a robot and- Whoa, boobs! What the heck? In my Godzilla movie? Actually, they used a mannequin body for Katsura in this scene, so they're not real boobs. But still, the implication of this scene. Oh my god. Anyways, Katsura is turned into a robot. Not only that, but her life support is linked with Mechagodzilla. So if she gets killed, Mechagodzilla dies too. This leads us to one of the best last 30 minutes of any Godzilla movie. It's filled with plenty of explosions by Mechagodzilla and city destruction by Titanosaurus. Speaking of which, Titanosaurus almost tramples on a few kids, to which Godzilla shows up and stops him. Here comes the hero, baby! The final fight is just brutal on Godzilla. He's on his own this time, fighting against two giant monsters, with one that's able to shoot missiles at him. Titanosaurus uses his tail to create gusts of wind to push Godzilla away. Then Godzilla tries to beat up Titanosaurus some more, but he gets his ass handed to him by Mechagodzilla, which is unfortunate. Godzilla doesn't get it so easy in this final fight. However, the humans are on Godzilla's side and shoot a tranquilizer of sorts into Titanosaurus's neck, which immobilizes him away from Godzilla for a while. Mechagodzilla nearly stops the humans, but surprise bitch, Godzilla's still alive and kicking. God, it is satisfying seeing Godzilla rise back up after getting the shit kicked out of him. Then Mechagodzilla just unleashes everything it's got on Godzilla, and it's super extreme. It even catches the suit on fire for a bit. Damn. But Godzilla keeps at it and beats the hell out of Mechagodzilla. In a fun twist, Godzilla rips his head off again, but this time Mechagodzilla can survive without it. So Godzilla needs a little more help to defeat him this time. Back with the human plot, Dr. Mifune and the aliens are eventually stopped and killed. Another character, Akira Ichinose, is in love with Mifune's daughter, Katsura. However, she explains to him that she must be killed in order to stop Mechagodzilla. But Akira can't bring himself to do it because he loves her too much. Then in a dark turn, Katsura kills herself, disabling Mechagodzilla. Aw, that's sad. But at least Godzilla is able to finish off Mechagodzilla and fries that some bitch. He also takes care of Titanosaurus while he's at it, and he does not let up on him. He just blasts him with his atomic breath and watches him fall over and die. Damn. After that, Akira brings Katsura out and lays her on the ground, as he watches Godzilla head out to sea one final time. Yeah, it's kind of crazy how Godzilla doesn't die in this movie, when this was meant to be the last film in the series for a good while. It's a bittersweet ending to the movie, and it's always stuck with me. Such an entertaining finale to this film. Way to go, Ashiro Honda. Sadly, even though this movie was well received by fans, it didn't do too well at the box office. Like Godzilla vs. Megalon, it only sold about 980,000 tickets in Japan, making this and Megalon the only two Godzilla movies not to sell a million tickets. It didn't do any better in America when it was released here as The Terror of Godzilla, somewhat passing off as if Godzilla is the main villain in the movie. Um, what moron made that choice? Aside from that, Terror of Mechagodzilla is a solid movie and one of the best in the Showa era. It has an amazing finale and one of the best monster fights ever. A great way to end off this era of Godzilla. Along with Fushiro Honda's directing career, it's kind of fitting that he was the one who started the Showa era and now he's the one who ends it. What a great movie for his career to go out on. Though there were plans to bring him back for 1993's Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2, but he sadly passed away before production began. Rest in peace, man. Still, Terror of Mechagodzilla is one of the best in the series, and it's absolutely one of my favorites, and I highly recommend checking this one out if you watched the first Mechagodzilla movie. It's a great sequel, and it may even be better than the previous movie. Great monster fights, a great soundtrack, great cinematography, great miniatures and practical effects, great movie. And thus, as Godzilla goes off in the ocean at the end of this movie, we've also met the end of the original Godzilla series. Phew, that sure took a while to talk about. I love Godzilla, you guys. Well, that wraps it up. I'll see you all in the Heisei era next, so thanks for watching. Yay!